Hi, everyone. Welcome to Prioritizing AI and ML Projects in Your Organization, a live interactive event collaboration between Fourthbrain and DeepLearning.ai. Backed by Andrew Ng's AI Fund, Fourthbrain helps you take your ML career to the next level. Our cohort-based courses are designed to help you fill your ML skills gaps with confidence alongside other practitioners looking to advance their career in AI. I'm excited to share that Fourth Brain is offering a special discount of $500 off either our MLOps or our machine learning engineer program for anyone that registered for this event. It's amazing to see viewers from all over the world joining us. Let's keep learning as a community together today and share a little bit about ourselves to kick things off. I'll start. I'm Greg Lochnane, the Director of Product and Curriculum at Fourth Brain, and I live in San Francisco. What about you? What do you do? Where are you calling in from? Let's see some uh, some stuff in the chat. Keep the intros coming. Wherever you are, as an ML practitioner, you know that the state of AI is always evolving, just like every company out there is trying to build AI-first products. Today, we're going to learn how two of the world's largest and most successful organizations make decisions about what innovative AI products they should try to build and productionize. You'll hear about how Cisco comes up with new AI engineering initiatives inside their networking and telecommunications business. And you'll hear about how JP Morgan, the parent company of JP Morgan Chase, is moving towards an AI first mindset when it comes to financial services. You're likely to walk away from today's session with some tips and tricks for creating real value through ML and AI projects in your company. If you hear anything that resonates with you or makes you curious, please post your questions in our online discourse community. You know the drill, just head on over to the Q&A page to create a new topic. You can find the links along with instructions in the event description box. A quick note on process before we dive in. We'll hear from our first speaker, then from our second speaker, and then the three of us We'll have a fireside chat to see if we can synthesize any learnings. Then we'll open it up for Q&A. With that, I'd like to give a warm welcome to our first speaker of the day, Kumaran Panambalam, Principal Engineer at Cisco. A big data enthusiast, you can find 31 of his courses on LinkedIn Learning, everything from Spark and Kafka to customer and business analytics. Kumaran, I'd like to bring you up on stage. We'd love to hear from you about how you'd prioritize AI and ML projects at Cisco. Take it away. Thanks, Greg. So in the next, uh, for the next 10 minutes, uh, I want, I'm gonna be focusing on how we are gonna pick and prioritize MLA projects for the organization, for your organization. Uh, just a brief introduction about myself. I'm a ML AI big data enthusiast, currently working as a principal engineer for AI in the emerging technologies and incubation group at Cisco, where we focus on the next generation of cutting edge technologies and solutions. I'm also an author on ML, AI and big data on LinkedIn learning. So there is a lot of excitement around AI ML in the past few years. Uh, there is a lot of hype around the groundbreaking potential of AI across multiple industries and segments. Uh, one side we have uh, the exponential growth of core AAML technologies uh, like you know deep learning is one example deep learning computer vision text processing and there's a lot of exponential growth that has happened there but uh, in parallel to that is that there is a rapidly growing ecosystem uh, for serving machine learning machine learning tools uh, technologies workflows there's a lot of thing happening here and and on the other side every business wants to add AI to its products and services. So this is kind of a standard a charter for a lot of uh, big companies uh, around the world. Also, every engineer wants to build ML models and ML products. So there is also an interest on the technology side. But what we also see uh, is that as everyone hurries to get into the AIML action, we are seeing a lot more failures uh, in getting AIML all the way to production than successes. So why is this happening? Uh, what are the reasons uh, that we are seeing these failures? And how can we fix them by prioritizing our projects correctly? 
So why do MLA projects fail? Uh, it first starts with uh, organizational commitment uh, from, from the business itself. First of all, there is a lack, a lack of understanding around what AI is, what exactly it can do, and what it cannot do. Second, it is usually run as side projects, like, okay, let's go and give it a little try, let's hire a couple of data scientists, and then see uh, what we can do there. But uh, that by itself doesn't lead to a proper uh, product or service. There is limited investment. There is no focused investment. It is again run as you know, somebody is a daytime engineer in another project, and this is more like you know a weekend project. There are no well-rounded teams. A lot of people think that you know you just invest in a couple of data scientists and you should be able to get it done, but then they do lack the support around those data scientists in terms of. Uh, data engineering, ML ops, uh, software engineering, uh, and, and a lot of those capabilities. There are no specific metrics and success criteria for planning and executing AI ML projects, specifically that is those critical to ML and AI. And then the bigger issue is the training data needs not are not well understood at all. While, yeah, everybody wants to build models, the biggest uh, prerequisite for this is good training data and the availability of it for data centers and that's also not well understood in terms of expectations pretty similar to the organization commitments what people uh, need to understand that AA projects are not software development lifecycle projects and you can't use the same exact uh, principle processes and methodologies that you use for software engineering projects on AI Second is that models won't be right all the time. So even when you build a model which is an accuracy of 95%, there are still cases where it will fail. And that simple thing is usually not understood. Uh, when a, whenever a model fails to predict something correctly, what you see is a JIRA ticket being raised saying that there is a defect that this use case was not addressed. So that the level understanding is that models are like software programs that has to be right all the time. Uh, and also the other thing that happens is that just because you built an accurate model doesn't mean you have a successful product. There is a whole journey that happens from building a model to making it a product and then scaling it and deploying it and making it usable by the end users. AA projects can fail simply because you know the model, the training data does not have the right signals to build an accurate model. So AA projects can fail. It is not like somebody gives you a set of requirements and you just do and code it and build a product. That's not how AA works. And regular SDLC processes also won't work in AA because it is not a forward process. It is a more iterative uh, experiment oriented process for AA as opposed to just building and delivering code and regular software development. So this these kind of uh, mis expectations uh, are, are also the reason why people expect and un have unreasonable expectations on AA projects. And that's one reason they don't deliver to those expectations. From a technical side, number one, the biggest issue is availability of training data. There is a lot of challenges for getting training data acquired for use by data scientists because a lot of this data has to be real. It has to be acquired from production databases and production database have all kinds of you know access limit restrictions for that. There are also security and privacy issues which customers are worried about if their training data is to be used for machine learning and we need to get explicit consent from these guys from the customers for using their data and that runs into a lot of uh, legal and contractual issues once we get the data there is also the challenges with labeling which a lot of people don't account for a lot of data that you get is not properly labeled or not labeled at all and you have to go through uh, some manual labeling efforts to get the data labeled correctly. Also, the data that you use does not have proper use case coverage. And this is a challenge for both those who are building general AA products across multiple industries. It's hard for you to get training data from each of the types of industries you want to support. You're usually starting up with one industry or a couple of data sets, building a model for that, and then trying to use it for other use cases. And that's where a lot of failures also happen. And finally, there is no a coherent data governance mechanism for training data. Training data is kind of just sitting there in files somewhere just used uh, at, in an ad hoc fashion by data scientists. It is not properly cataloged, managed. So those also lead to a lot of issues in terms of proper machine learning processes. From a product point of view, it also is required to have 
uh, yearly validation whether this solution is going to work or not. So when we are planning for AI, there is no equivalent planning of how does this model that we build make it to an end-to-end -end solution? What are the supporting uh, infrastructures needed around them in terms of services and UIs and stuff like that that is needed to make it a complete solution? Uh, what are the customer expectations? How does the customers expect this uh, model to deliver? Uh, then there is revenue and cost implications. A lot of the AA models fail because they do not create enough value for the amount of cost it takes to deliver them. A lot of them are built based on deep learning models, which definitely a lot of times need uh, re expensive resources like uh, GPUs, but the value they deliver to the end customer uh, and the revenue they can may not match the cost of delivery. So that's also another concern. There are also alternatives that people don't look at. There is a tendency to go and build everything in-house while there are open source models, libraries available that do the same thing. And we also need to look at what the competition is doing in terms of how they are building these services and delivering these services. There's a lot of thing about, okay, it's the excitement about trying to use a new technology without validation as to how that will be delivered as a product or service and generate revenues. So one of the big, so organizational commitments and expectations, this need to be addressed at an executive level. And we're not going to get into that in this presentation. But what we're going to look at is about uh, creating an AAML project evaluation criteria. How do we evaluate project ideas for AAML and choose the right projects to work on so that it reduces risk of failure and increases the probability of success? So we're going to look at some uh, the list of evaluation criteria that you should be using uh, when you are evaluating whether to pursue a AML project or not. So the first um, evaluation criteria would be business value in terms of, okay, this idea that we're talking about, what kind of revenue it will generate or what kind of saving it then generates, what kind of business impact it generates. The second is what is the, what would be the cost of serving this? You know, it's very, very hard to kind of predict both of them at the initial stages, but some kind of a rough cut estimate, some kind of risk modeling uh, would help here to get a better picture here. There is also time to market as to, you know, how quickly can we build it? Uh, is it going to take many months of resource uh, effort or is it going to be a few months? That also is under the criteria. There is the build versus buy a decision, other, whether, whether some of those technologies are available off the market that we can just take and reuse it. Is there a need for us to build it in-house? Even if you have to build it in-house, from what level? Are we just going to reuse some open source models and build a, something over it? Are we going to use something like transfer learning? Or are we going to create a brand new architecture? Uh, we also need to look at the, what the competition is doing to say, you know, uh, at the end of the day, once we have a model running, are you going to be way behind competition, way ahead of competition? That's also something you need to look at. Another, the second set of criteria is around data. Um, we need to look at for developing this model, what kind of training data is needed and if that data is actually available to us, uh, are there, there any restrictions in terms of actual data being accessible versus data is accessible, but we need customer permissions and stuff like that. What are the labeling annotation requirements and how much effort is going to take? If you are using third party for labeling, how much cost it is going to take? What kind of feature engineering uh, efforts do you need? You know, do you, you have to invest in a couple of data engineers to do this and possibly build a data processing pipeline to execute this. So that also need to be considered. Security, privacy, ethics consideration in terms of data, what we're using, what we are predicting. Is it, uh, you know, it is, is it ethical? Is it explainable? All those things also need to be looked at. Storage and management cost, uh, whenever there is data, it needs to be properly cataloged and managed. And there is, again, a cost associated with that also. A third set of criteria is around building blocks. Now, uh, rarely do people build a, an AA solution right from scratch, right? So today we reuse something off the market and then build on top of it. So for the model, what the kind of applications we are trying to build, are there algorithms already available in the market as open source or, or, or even if you have to purchase it, or do I have to build it all myself? Can I use pre-trained models and libraries that are available? Are they already available? I can reuse them. 
more so other products and services available if you go to like google or aw there's a lot of ai services available like sentiment analysis and text to speech and speech to text which you can leverage off the board and you don't need to have to go and build them what kind of tools techniques automation capabilities are available uh, to support your models uh, this is right this is around the whole ml life cycle or ml ops uh, experiment tracking model management uh, serving capabilities all of that also what is available and what does it take to integrate this model into your entire solution what is there a path forward is there already an, a plug available so i can just go plug in my model or there is a lot of engineering resource effort needed on the solution side to use the model so that also need to be looked at as building blocks and then the final set of criteria is around the kind of people we have Again, people and resources is something, again, people just, we just talk about data scientists, data scientists, but that's in a team of like, if I, if I have a team of 10 people working on an AML project, only two or three of them would be data scientists. The rest would be other categories like, okay, you need data engineering folks to work on the data and be able to do feature engineering. We need software engineering folks to kind of build like APIs and services around this and make them scalable services and then have create dockers and Kubernetes pipelines. You need ML ops and DevOps people to actually go deploy them, maintain them, manage them, manage the life cycle of these services. And then we also need hardware, especially we know that uh, deep learning models may need GPUs for better uh, performance. So those are our expensive resources and whether we would have access to all of them. So are these, this is the kind of evaluation criteria you want to look at. And this is again, just a, a recommended list. You should be able to add more criteria based on your own use case and your own company. Once you have the evaluation criteria and you know, how do you go through the project selection process? So uh, how do you go and select, uh, create a list of ML projects and, and choose them, choose the best ones to work on? So we always start with your selection criteria. So you want to create, have that list as a limited list. Have it measurable, something that says yes or no, or you can have a score to it. Some, somewhere that you can quanti quantify uh, how well a given project uh, you know meets this criteria. It is also good to have weights for criteria or not all criteria uh, are equal. You can have different weights for different criteria. That may again depend upon your use case and your company. The second is to collect a list of use cases, possible use cases. This is where I think people tend to go very, very narrow in terms of, you know, just ask the product manager to come up with use cases kind of. But where we should go and look for use cases is go look at your customers, your, all your employees, look at what's happening in the industry to kind of collect what are the, all the possible use cases that we can focus on. And it, it, you can also conduct some in, uh, tournaments within your company called innovation tournaments, where you can look at kind of have people, you know, recommend some solutions. And so it, the bigger the pool of uh, use cases we can collect, the higher the chance of you hitting upon a gold mine. So the more the, the more the better in the case of use cases. Then you go through an evaluation and scoring process and you know, make sure that this process is rational and independent and you're able to model risk because a lot of times you won't even know the answers, right? How much revenue will this bring in? I don't know. So how do you model that risk? And this should be like a multi-step funnel, like very similar to how your sales and marketing funnel looks like. Like it starts with the, so you go through a multi-step evaluation, like a business evaluation, technical evaluation, uh, and a resource evaluation. So it kind of narrows down to a, a small set of projects. Now, the one thing I recommend is not to go for just this, find this one project and you know fully focus on just that one project it should be more like how you maintain a stock for portfolio is you create a portfolio with multiple projects because a projects can fail you don't want to just invest everything in one project so have multiple projects choose these projects across multiple horizons like you know the near horizon like next six months uh, medium horizon like you know six to 18 months and, and a long horizon like beyond 18 months so there may be some projects that are low-hanging fruit uh, based on the evaluation you do, which uh, again, based on the amount of effort needed to execute and time to market. And some may be really strategic ones, but you know, you may not have all the technologies readily available for you to execute, execute on that. So there you have to go back, you know, and wait for a longer time, do some research. So it's good to have a portfolio and make sure you fund and track each of them independently. And finally, expect failures. You know, two of three, the three projects will fail. That's one reason why you want a portfolio. 
uh, how do you ensure success? Uh, right. First of all, create metrics for tracking. And these should be model metrics, product metrics, and adoption metrics. So model metrics is all the FN scores and those kind of stuff. Product metrics is like latency, accuracy, you know, those kind of targets. And adoption is how well the customers are using it. And set these expectations correctly with executives in terms of goals, risks, dependencies, timelines. Review the progress and results periodically and have these decision gates where you can make no goal no go decisions if if an ml project is just you know going around in circles without making any progress on the model maybe it's time to shelve that project and move on to the next project so we should be open to that do not expect every project to go through its full life cycle and do not expect every project to be successful so we should be able to that's why the portfolio approach helps here and key takeaways uh aml projects are unique organization commitment is key to success a well-defined selection criteria helps invest in the right projects. More ideas equals better projects. And of course, make sure you track them and also act on them and make this hard decisions when the time comes. Uh, that's it from me. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for that great presentation, Kumaran. Uh, I wanted to kind of double click in on one of the things that you mentioned a few times, which was metrics. Mm -hmm. So. You know, we have this difference when we're trying to build AI products between metrics that come out of your model and then metrics that actually are occurring at, at the business level, your KPIs. Are, is there anything specific that you tell your team when they set out on a new project in terms of looking at specific metrics and planning to hit this sort of go, no go gate? Um, and, you know, timelines, are there metrics you aim at more generally than others? And sort of what do you think about model accuracy as a metric? So so uh, I see whenever a model goes through, it goes through three rounds of evolution before it becomes production. The first round of evolution is building an accurate model. Can the model actually predict what it is supposed to predict? In that stage, you're focused a lot on model metrics, like right? accuracy, you know, uh, error rates, you know, that those kind of stuff focused on how accurate the model is. The second thing happens when you're trying to then take this model and scale it up and trying to use it for, you know, a wider, you know, trying to kind of use it for a, how do I handle thousand concurrent requests? You know, how do I add general large volumes? Then you're focused on a different set of metrics, which are more like, you know, latency, uh, you know, throughput, uh, CPU usage, memory usage, cost, you know, that's a different set of things you look at in the second stage. Once you're past that and say, okay, we got these reasonable, then you then get it to a, POC to a customer. At that stage, you're looking at more customer usage metrics, you know, maybe get some explicit feedback, like thumbs up, thumbs down, something like that, or kind of measure, you know, based on the customer's next action, you know that if it is working or not, let's say you're recommending a product to a customer, the customer clicks on the link, it means that, yeah, it has been, it is, it is a good recommendation. So, so that kind of metrics, you, there are different sets of metrics that you collect at different stages of your uh, progress. Uh, and that's what you use to kind of move the product along to the next stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to come back to that in our uh, in our fireside chat. Thank you so much again for your for your great presentation, Kumran. We'll see you back in just a little while. Uh, we're, next up, we're going to bring in Andrea Stefanucci. It's my pleasure to introduce him. Uh, quick note to the audience: uh, you know, David, Luis, Philippe, uh, we are taking questions, and if you if you put them on Discourse, we will answer them in the in the fireside chat or in the Q&A afterwards. So if you put it in the YouTube Q&A, if you put it in discourse, we will get to it, we promise. So with that, we've got Andrea Stefanucci in the house. He is head of AI strategy and product management at JP Morgan AI Research. With over 15 years experience in the financial services industry, working with some top firms, including McKinsey, Bain, Accenture, he currently leads a growing team of over 80 AI, 80 AI researchers. So we're really excited to have Andrea in the house today. He's gonna to tell us about how JP Morgan deals with prioritizing AI and ML projects. Andrea. Thank you, Greg, for the very kind introduction. And uh, um, thank you, Kumaran, for uh, you know the great presentation. So we'll, we'll discuss more uh, in, uh, in the later Q&A regarding uh, the different topics. But what I was hoping to do now, it's for the next 10 minutes, cover, um, the topic, how we're thinking about prioritizing AI and ML projects uh, at our firm, right, at JP Morgan. I'll cover both uh, 
initially like a use case a specific view and then more like a long-term view how we think about scaling AI and ML across the firm. Um, so I'll skip this slide. Actually, Greg uh, did a great job introducing myself. So uh, we'll, we'll skip this. We'll, uh, um, what I wanted to, um, going into the specific topic, I wanted to cover initially like the, the, the topic around like impact of uh, AI and ML projects. Uh, the, it's broader actually than AI and ML projects. So as we think about impact, um, there are, fundamentally we think about two dimension. Uh, there is a financial impact. There are the usual metrics around revenue generation or revenue protection, cost reduction, but in certain cases also cost avoidance. Like, can I do more with the same resources uh, thanks to the ability of AI to, to help us scale our, our processes, our capabilities? And, and then there is also co a component around risk reduction. Can we reduce uh, frauds? Can, you, can we reduce the risk of, uh, of operational uh, errors, of losses of various kinds? So there is this um, financial component that's uh, typically very prominent as we think about prioritization of projects, um, but uh, and, and not uh, uh, equally important, if even more, uh, there is a component about non-financial uh, impact and metrics. They're a bit more difficult to um, to quantify measures. And, and there, uh, there are things like uh, client experience, uh, how we can delight clients through innovative AI capabilities, employee experience, um, how we can help employees move away from like t tedious tasks, more to value-added activities and have uh, AI and ML help more with these uh, more repetitive tasks. Uh, and then there is a component about like uh, reputation, credibility, both with clients, but also with the, with the broader ecosystem. Uh, and finally, there is also a big one, especially at the beginning in the AI and ML journey for a firm, it's around culture change. So fundamentally, uh, at the beginning, like uh, in many cases, the business may be skeptical on what I can do, what I cannot do, even not understanding really uh, what are the AI capabilities. So really, uh, in the first phase of AI adoption, it's very important to uh, to get some AI successes, like use cases where uh, we're transforming parts of the business and showcases uh, showcasing what AI can do. And, the impact may be, from a financial point of view, may be limited, but the culture change uh, impact may be very large and can then open up many more possibilities, right? Can, can get the business to think more uh, in a more innovative way on like other AI opportunities that are larger. Um, so then uh, as we think about prioritization, um, so I covered in the previous slide, the impact, uh, the business value component. Um, at the same time, as Kumaran uh, mentioned, uh, there is another important driver uh, dimension that's around cost, feasibility, risk. Um, and here, like, there are many, many components already Kumaran covered around like data, availability, data quality, AI talent. Do we have the right AI talent to cover specific use cases? Um, uh, engineering effort, infrastructure cost, uh, also like a, a business adoption readiness. Is the specific business unit ready to adopt these innovative uh, capabilities? And there is, a, and then we go more into the uh, risk area of the equation. So security, privacy, regulatory risk, reputational risk. Um, so really, uh, like bringing all this together, we uh, we then have an assessment of cost, feasibility, and risk. And then uh, as we look at use cases uh, on uh, on these metrics, uh, impact and feasibility, then fundamentally, um, there are four key areas we can think about. Uh, um, there are like some quick wins where the feasibility, it's, uh, uh, the cost is very low, uh, the impact is high. So there are a bit like uh, cases, there are no brainer to uh, to really like prioritize and execute. Then there are some projects that are much harder, ma and they may have a much bigger impact. And, and this, uh, they're riskier, but they're also very important in the overall portfolio. Um, then there are projects where um, really the, the costs uh, and the impact are both low, 
uh, the, we typically would not prioritize unless we don't have enough use cases on the top part. And then there is the no-go zone where uh, really the, the costs and the resources are necessary to do the use case, uh, it's higher than the impact. So really the, the, the net impact would be negative. Uh, and echoing one point that Kumaran mentioned, really, we should think about a portfolio approach. So uh, we should think about uh, use cases across the board where um, often like the big bets, some of the big bets may fail, but then we have quick wins that can compensate in the short term the impact and really generate success and excitement in the organization. Um, so this is around uh, use case prioritization. Um, then uh, in reality, um, as we went through the, this journey in our firm, um, like we, we figured out that uh, use cases are very important for uh, AI adoption. But then, however, like uh, in many cases, like individual use cases, they move, they don't move that much the needle. Uh, it, in many cases, it's really important to take a full uh, business area, a slice of the business, and trying to reinvent with uh, AI and ML at the, at the center, at the core. And there, um, it's really where we see like uh, uh, a multiplier effect, like a step change. So, uh, so really like uh, uh, eventually over time, uh, we moved away from like individual use case prioritization more to think which part of the business which slice of the business we want to transform. And uh, this, this theme was also uh, highlighted in a recent Harvard Business Review uh, article on uh, uh, getting out of scale. So it's really the direction of like how to move away from, or like how to complement individual use case with like the scalability and, uh, um, and uh, like uh, a multiplier impact about AI. Um, so um, as we think about then uh, this uh, multi-year journey uh, and um, the shift from uh, like establishing first an AI capability and AI team, then to get the scale, the overall impact, uh, there are different uh, building blocks, building blocks uh, that uh, we uh, we put in place over time or we thought about. So definitely there is. Um, a component about like foundational enablers. So establishing the right teams, uh, the uh, central AI and ML teams, the decentralized AI and ML teams aligned with the different business units, uh, but at the same time creating uh, cross-cutting capabilities that um, are common across uh, different transformation, different use cases, and can enable scale and uh, prevent duplication of effort. Um, then there is also a big component around like setting up the right ecosystem, the right infrastructure, um, enabling for rapid experimentation and removing barriers to data access. So, so really like uh, uh, the component around infrastructure, uh, data access and uh, um, development environment to, to enable uh, data scientists to be very productive and, uh, and effective and efficient. Uh, and then clearly there is a component around uh, attracting top AI talent, there is uh, clearly a work for talent. So really, uh, this component is very important in the AI strategy for the firm, how to get the right talent to address and to enable um, us to, to tackle the various use cases and the various opportunities. Um, then uh, on the top part, as we think about uh, um, the overall journey, um, initially, um, as we think about the adoption in the firm, um, there is a big component around like education on AI uh, to the business. Uh, really, um, in many cases, there are a lot of opportunities out there in the business uh, that AI can nicely target, but the business is not aware of what AI can do or cannot do. So um, on our side, we spent a lot of time to really educating AI, uh, the business on uh, like the possibilities of AI and also showing like successful use cases to stimulate the imagination of the business. Um, and then uh, there is at the same time, another component around like um, transparency and like AI adoption. Um, really uh, like uh, the journey to adopt AI, it's a multi-year journey. So we need to know 
for a specific uh, process or for a specific area? Where did we start? Where we are in the journey? And what is the target once it's fully transformed with the eye at the center? Um, and then as we think about like more the uh, midterm view, really, as I was mentioning, we uh, were thinking about like uh, transforming full slices of the bank or of the firm with the eye. Uh, and eventually launch AI first products that would not be possible with uh, without AI and commercialize AI capabilities. So it goes from the initial phase around like education, awareness, um, initial successful use cases, then to full transformation and uh, commercialization. Um, and then in the next couple of slides, I'm going to cover in more detail a couple of these topics: the cross-cutting capabilities and uh, the end-to-end -end transformation. And then we'll uh, we'll wrap up. Um, so in terms of uh, capabilities, um, as we went through different use cases uh, in our firm, uh, we figured out that like, there are like common capabilities that keep coming up across uh, different use cases. So there is really a possibility to establish common capabilities that can be reusable and they can make the next use case, um, the next project uh, much uh, much uh, easier to to target and and therefore reduce the the cost and the feasibility uh, increase the feasibility for the next use case uh, and here I listed in this slide some of the themes and some of the capabilities that emerge in our in our journey some of them may be specific more to the finance domain but some others are more uh, generic uh, for example th there is a big component around like uh, in our space around intelligent client interaction, uh, how we can personalize the offering to the clients, how we can really um, like engage, uh, manage the communication to the client with the client to be smarter and identifying opportunities more and more um, for the next uh, uh, iteration and also like how to do intelligent pricing. So there is a big component around um, intelligent client interaction that it's common across different business units. Um, and then there is uh, there are also some common capabilities that are um, enabling other uh, AI use cases. Uh, a big one it's around like uh, explainability of AI. So how to establish uh, tools and capabilities to make our models more explainable over time, um, and how to customize existing uh, tools and approaches to the finance domain. Um, so I'm not cover the other um, uh, areas, but I'm happy to um, then answer questions as, as we go in the Q&A. Um, and then uh, the last slide I wanted to cover, it's uh, really uh, an example of how we think about end-to-end -end transformation. So uh, here, uh, this is a journey that we started in um, for our um, client onboarding process. The, it's an area where we, we employ about 3,000 3, people in the firm. Um, and really, the, the question is, uh, starting from uh, uh, the current level where um, the process is primarily done manually with some digital tools, how do we get then to uh, the ultimate stage where we have um, a continuous onboarding process uh, without human intervention? And, uh, there is a specificity in, in the finance domain where we need to review clients periodically also to understand like uh, were there significant change in the client profile so here the question is how ai can really enable this continuous monitoring without uh humans in the loop and really involving the uh, the humans the operators only on high risk cases where really uh, it's very important to have uh, humans to make a judgment call where versus um uh, there are most of the cases uh, they are they require just um, a, co a collection of data analysis, um, even a smart collection of data from from public sources, from internal sources, and then like uh, reasoning around this data. But there are areas that AI can really uh, can really target nicely. So how do we think about the current level? Uh, what is the ultimate goal two three years on the road, and then how we go through uh, the roadmap and the different use cases to fully transform this. Uh, this lies of the of the organization. So I'll, I'll wrap up here. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, this, um, uh, the the topics that cover my presentation, and uh, I'm happy to to go more in detail later on. And uh, there was really a topic around prioritization, both financial and non-financial impact to be uh, to be considered. 
then how to scale up um, uh, AI in the organization, looking at this end-to-end -end transformation of parts of the bank and moving away a bit from just individual use cases. The multi-year journey, starting from establishing the capabilities then to, to full transformation, and then this concept about common capabilities and levels, levels of AI in this uh, multi-year journey. So I'll stop here. I'll uh, pass it back to Greg. Um, I'm happy to answer uh, questions as we go through. Thanks, Andrea, so much for that presentation. Uh, I wanted to just follow up with a quick question for you. It really kind of piqued my interest when you're talking about the uh, the quick wins. I know you've been at you know the the head role there at J.P. Morgan for the last two and a half years. When you look back, are there any sort of kind of classic quick wins that you think represent kind of your industry and sort of the the, the space these days? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I in, uh, in our industry, or uh, specifically in our team, I think we saw a lot of quick wins in areas uh, related to NLP capabilities. Uh, like in um, in our space, like given that our industry, it's a traditional industry, uh, there are a lot of documents, a lot of emails, uh, a lot of uh, language related to other communication to clients or contracts, uh, documents. So in that space, there is... Uh, most of this information as of now, it's uh, managed by humans, right? But there is an opportunity and we saw like uh, at scale uh, of both like automating processes, but also extracting insights and signals that can help us better target clients. So that is an area where we saw a lot of quick wins uh, in the last couple of years. Very nice, very nice. Yeah, NLP is on the rise uh, yeah. for sure. Um, fantastic, thank you so much again, Andrea. I'm going to bring Kumaran back up on stage for our our, uh, our Q&A session now. We're going to actually just go straight into audience Q&A because you guys have asked so many amazing questions. And we're going to start with the uh, the discourse questions. So uh, these are some kind of more, more technical ones we're going to kick it off with. I'm going to start with you, Kumaran. Uh, what are the best libraries, preferably <laughs> open source for AIML? I, I don't know that there is a very you know, straight answer to this. It's based on your use case. Um, there are, of course, you know, the popular ones like scikit-learn has been very popular. And as of now, you see TensorFlow and PyTorch have also been popular. Uh, but I, I would say, yeah, I mean, there are a set of popular libraries. I wouldn't call anything the most uh, that's based on the user preference as well as uh, the use case. Perfect segue. Speaking of PyTorch and TensorFlow, are you a PyTorch or a TensorFlow shop? Uh, there at Cisco. Both. Both. You have any personal preference? You know, what do you think of uh, either one? Sort of uh, one to one, same capability, just different. I would say cases? similar, uh, and both yeah. of them are rapidly evolving to catch up with each other. So it's not like you know, TensorFlow had a much better serving, uh, but PyTorch have also caught up with that. Uh, with uh, Torch Serve, so it's kind of you know they're both competitors, so they're just catching up with each other all the time. So. There's right. no fixed answer to that. <laughs> right. TensorFlow serving. Yeah. And then NVIDIA has got their serving yep. and then everybody's got their serving now. And, and that's the new thing. Uh, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to kick this one over to Andrea. So what do production contracts look like for AI projects? Are there requirements proven by testing methods? So uh, maybe you can talk yeah. a little bit about what contracts look like for you. Yeah. So, um, so fundamentally, um, it's a bit the specificity of uh, the financial industry, but uh, we're required by regulation to have a separate function that's called Modern Risk Governance uh, uh, Group. The, it's a separate team that really tests the model, verifies the model independently, uh, and then like benchmark the model. So really, uh, the bar to bring models in production in our space, it's very high, and we have this independent team doing all uh, all the necessary tests uh, like documentation review so uh, that process for uh, uh, like high risk models may take uh, like months uh, but then uh, that provides the right comfort uh, like we have all the controls in place to to then uh, run the models in production and then um, there are uh, there are cases where um, sometimes we, we there is a distinction in our space between models and analytical tool uh, analytical tools are 
um, AI algos where a human still is in the loop. So it's a, um, it's a model that provides insights or prediction, but then to a human to consume. Then in those cases, in, in a production environment, the, um, the, the controls are a, a bit uh, lighter compared to a model. But again, we, we have like different requirements in place to, to comply with. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you're saying the bar is very high in, in your industry, and, and I get the sense it's probably very high in yours too, Kumaran, right, with the telecom business? Is it depends, that... uh, depends on what the use case is, like, uh, you know, uh, the financial use cases may have, you know, much higher bar. Uh, again, depends on, you know, uh, the thing is, what is the cost of a failure? Yeah. Right. Uh, so right. yes, right. for example, you're going to Amazon uh, website and then on the left, right side, it is giving you all the recommendations. There are sometimes it gives you really crappy recommendations. So what, you know, you just ignore and move on as opposed to, you know, in, in a healthcare situation where you make a wrong prediction and a patient dies, you know, that's a different situation. So your bars, your testing, your uh, metrics, everything is different based on the use case you're doing. Yeah, perfect. And then, you know, Darshan asks a little bit about that failure mitigation. And he asks, how do we do risk modeling in terms of that failure mitigation? So maybe, maybe Andrea, can you talk a little bit about how you sort of, how, she, how you sort of predict risk ahead of time with some of these projects in terms of that failure? Yeah, so there is a component about like risk modeling uh, that's around risk modeling for the business right and then there is a risk of the model itself right so we use uh, models of various nature to predict and manage risk from a business perspective like uh, credit risk or operational risk risk of fraud you know it's a big area as well so uh, in terms of uh, model risk as i was mentioning there are uh, there are like in a, in a bank, there are separate functions like this model risk review that does an independent review of the model end to end, uh, and then there are uh, there are processes to run uh, the the model in parallel with existing processes to have uh, backup plans. Uh, so if the model fails, we have like uh, a backup process to go to and different controls. So really, to have the to go to an STP process where uh, there is no human in the loop uh, requires, you know, uh, like quite a significant time. Um, right, right. Yeah, I like your differentiation between risk of the model and risk of the business. So, you know, Andrea, when you're looking at kind of creating a new project, is the risk of the business always trumping risk of the model? Or sometimes are you building bottom up versus sort of top down? Yeah, so um, I think both are important, but fundamentally, the, uh, the they need to come together, right? Because uh, um, like fundamentally, we, the ultimate goal is business adoption, right? And uh, making sure that the business is comfortable with what the model does and uh, the, out the outcomes and when the model doesn't work properly. So um, really. I think they need to come together. So you need to have in the room business people, modelers, uh, technologists, and like uh, complement all the different components. Mm, mm. Is that a similar process in uh, in your role, Kumran? Or do you have to get a lot of stakeholders in the room before you start something new? Yes, I'm, I think that there, there is definitely the validation, right? When you say business, uh, what does it mean to our business? How does it going to change it? Uh, you know, that is a big uh, question because ultimately whatever you build, it feed into uh, your business, especially if you are a for-profit company. Your ultimate goal mm -hmm. is your business results. So whatever you're doing is towards that. So you always want to look at that first and make sure, you know, even if I build the model, what is the point if it, it won't be adopted because there are business risks around it. So that is the first gate that you pass saying, is the business okay with, uh, you know, are there no negative consequences first before you move on to saying what are the positive ones, right? Hmm. So, yeah, going up another level, sort of before you get everyone in the room, all these stakeholders, you have to sort of generate ideas, right? You have to generate mm -hmm. kind of some new innovative ideas. And Sawyer asks, do you have any advice for generating innovative ideas to develop a portfolio of AI and ML projects? Like, how have you done this and how do you do this today in your organization, uh, Andrea? Yeah. So uh, there are different ways, right? Uh, fundamentally, the, the first step is to educate in the business, right? Like making sure that the business understand what I can do, what I cannot do, 
what were like successful examples in the past. So to do that, we did there are like different avenues, right? Mm -hmm. There is like uh, traditional education courses, uh, but also like uh, uh, showcases where we bring the business, we show example of uh, previous projects, what other firms are doing, newsletters, like uh, you name all the marketing, you know, component around it. So and then really uh getting the business to think about like opportunities and then come to us with ideas and at the same time we generate also ideas on our side and then having workshops where we take certain business area and we think together like how this business area will look like you know three years on the road with the AI, right like uh, mm. how uh, like how would like more reimagination sessions and then starting from that then you go back and you think how do we get there right what are the some interesting use cases to get to that vision mm. reimagination sessions that is so starting at the end is this yeah. uh, kumaran is this something that you you sort of are doing at cisco as well do you kind of we look have around a, we and have find a, all the best new stuff so we have a process in in our uh, in our emerging tech and incubation team that we ran across cisco that is called bold bits uh, it's a, it's a scheme for collecting ideas and then you know progressively filtering it and coming up with this portfolio. Um, you want to read about it? There is a book called Innovation Tournaments. You can find it on Amazon. It was written by a Wharton professor, uh, whom I am a student of. So, um, so that book will retell you the process of how you run this innovation tournament. You know, from collecting ideas to filtering them to uh, getting them executed, everything. Nice, nice. So, you know, when you're looking around and you're out sort of doing some brainstorming, seeing what the market is doing, I imagine you're probably usually looking at what's the new thing, right? You're, you're obviously taking that into account. Spencer Smith asks, it feels pretty clear that neural networks are the future of AI and ML. Will shallow learning techniques eventually become obsolete or will they still have a place in businesses, Kumaran shaking his head. Let's start with you, Kumaran. What do you think? So, so um, if you look at how it progressed, right? I mean, initially uh, the models were built on uh, structured data. That's where all your classical uh, tech, uh, algorithms, like whether it's naive bias, or regression, decision trees, were working on, and then they were not able to solve text mining and vision. That's where neural networks came into picture. One thing you always have to remember is neural networks uh, models are more expensive to execute in the order of n times more than your classical models. So if my use case, I'm able to get the right level of accuracy with just a, a shallow model, why do I need a neural network, which is more expensive for me to execute, which will take more horsepower and more cost to uh, execute and maintain. So it's kind of that, right? If I can get it done with my with the smaller models, I would go for that. If my smaller models are not capable of handling and being able to come up with predictions, it's not capable, then I go to neural networks. Hmm. Even in neural networks, right? How many layers do you have in the network? You don't just like that go and throw 100 layers in there. You start with two. And then you keep increasing the layers as you, know, you see that it is lacking in accuracy, the same thing. It's it's not just about the performance; it's also about cost. Also, adding on that, in many cases there is an explainability component, right? yes. like um, either by regulation or by because the business has certain requirements, we need the models to be fully explainable. So, uh, in those in those cases, like we need to revert to simpler models to have better you know, explainability compared to more advanced models. Yeah, that. That's a fantastic point, Andrea. Actually, in a great segue, Pratik asks, how are explainable AI techniques used in the industry today? This is a hot topic. And which ones are the most used ones? Um, maybe you can talk uh, first on this, Andrea. Yeah. Um, so uh, for us, it's a huge topic. Indeed, uh, two years ago, we established an explainable AI center of excellence. So we have a dedicated team of... Uh, 20 plus people just working on explainable AI. Um, and uh, it's a big topic, uh, especially in the retail banking business, but also in, uh, in the markets, trading and so on. Um, and really one typical example is uh, if, um, if a client apply for a credit card and we reject, we need to provide an explanation. It's uh, required by regulation. So uh, whatever model we use, the model needs to generate 
an explanation. So that is an area where as we develop more complicated models, then uh, we need to, uh, explainability needs to go hand in hand. So we uh, traditionally we use sharp techniques, but then we're trying to, we're really working on enhancing them, uh, really making them customized over space to, um, to really like push the bar. Um, but also like uh, in other cases, we found that even when there are no specific uh, requirements, actually explainability helps a lot with, mo with uh, model adoption. And there was a case where um, we developed a model for matching companies to investors. And uh, we were providing those outputs to bankers, right? Then to engage with, uh, uh, like, to, to capture this opportunity. And, and the bankers were really, like, at the beginning saying that the model doesn't make sense, the results are uh, completely off. But then as soon as we generated explanation for why the model was recommending certain term matches, and then the adoption went through the roof uh, because uh, like humans were not able to understand like certain information in the data that was not ob obvious that the model was capturing. So, so then when you sort of looked at this model, it wasn't working. People said, oh, like, I don't believe that. And you said, oh, no, this is exactly why it's happening. They sort of yeah. let you keep going and you could kind of go through those iteration loops on it because yeah. of that explainability. Correct. Yeah. Fundamentally, because it, when they were showing us example where the model was incorrect, then we looked at the data and like it made a lot of sense why the model was recommending things. So really like then we generated automatically this, this explanations for every recommendation, right? And th that really changed the, it, it was like, there were simple explanations, so, but really like from a business perspective, it really changed the adoption equation. Wow, yeah. So I wonder if you've seen similar things, Kumran, I'm thinking there's sort of this connection between explainability and almost ML ops as you're, as you're running the iteration you know, people don't really believe necessarily the early stages of it until it really starts getting going. Have you seen this before as well? Uh, I've seen it much earlier in my career uh, when I was using more classical techniques. And, and the best thing to do there is like things like regression or decision trees, where you know what the model is doing exactly, what weight it's providing to each of the the feature attributes. So that's why I saw. Off late, I've been working more on, you know, the kind of uh, what do you call speech to text text to speech point of things where it's like there is nothing called explainability there <laughs> you get it or you don't get it right what the speaker is saying you translate it or don't translate it so i've not seen a lot of that in my field but i see also that this field is very new right it's not like mature to kind of make a call these are the techniques these are the the best recommendations it's a very evolving thing people are now focused on how we can we do black box explanation, which is like, I don't need to know the model, but can I look at the results and do something out of it? So there is a lot of research going on there, but I don't think we have a, a very concrete, uh, you know, uh, thing about this is what the process is, this is the best practice or anything like that. It is an evolving uh, field. Hmm. Very cool, very cool. So I wanna, I wanna kind of throw another technical question in here. Uh, have you used reinforcement learning in any of your, recent projects or solutions that were successful? Uh, Andrea? So it's a, it's a bit more on the research side. It's not applied at scale, but uh, we're using reinforcement learning in, uh, in markets to fundamentally where uh, uh, we build, we have like a simulation environment where uh, we have like different agents uh, and we're testing trading strategies in this uh, simulation environment, multi-agent simulation environment. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Reinforcement learning, it's one of the key techniques used in that space, but it's still more on the research space where uh, we publish some papers around it, but it's not used, you know, uh, at scale in the business yet. Mm, interesting. Do you use it in the in the business at Cisco, Kumran? Anywhere? Um, um, again, it's in the research state. We don't have any uh, technical applications yet on that. Very cool. Very cool. So sort of the modeling and simulation pieces that feed AI, those are more on the research side. These days, you're, you're really just sort of leveraging like data collected from the real world rather than simulated data in most cases. Is that right, Kumran? Uh, we kind of use both. Uh, there is synthetic data and real yeah. data because real data is, is kind of scarce because I work mostly in the customer world. So customer data is hard to come by. 
So we do kind of synthesize data using real data as kind of the uh, seed. And mm. we do that, use that a lot. Yeah, we're using synthetic data quite a bit as well uh, in cases where either real data are not available or there are like confidentiality issues uh, for not using real data or the quality of real data is not good enough. So there, there are different cases. There, there was uh, one uh, recent case where we're trying to train uh, an algo to read uh, unwritten te text from, uh, from checks. Uh, and we did not have enough examples, so we we generated synthetic and written signatures to to train the algo. Nice, nice. So I want to kind of zoom out a little bit and talk about kind of some of the longer term business strategy. So when you think about key drivers, so data science with Sam asks, what are the key drivers to define ROI matrix for model development? that align with business strategy. And I'm sort of thinking about some of the more, I'm thinking about the, the top right hand of your plot, Andrea, sort of these longer term strategic vision, kind of maybe even, you know, two or three years in the AI space is a very, very long time. I mean, how are you really defining these ROI matrices and, and aligning these with business strategy? Yeah, so fundamentally, uh, as I was mentioned, in terms of ROI return, uh, so really, if you look at the, my metrics, the return, it's uh, the vertical axis, and then investment is the horizontal, right? So uh, return, it's uh, really can be financial or non-financial, but as uh, um, Greg, as you were mentioning, like some of the projects may be long-term, right? So um, the impact may only come up in one two three years i think what what is important in those cases to define uh, clear pilots or clear test cases or pocs where we can test some of the impact at smaller scale uh, in a few months or in half a year uh, before like waiting you know the the full uh, uh the, the full timeline for the world project so like how do we test if we're in the right direction in terms of delivering the overall impact how we change course how do we track certain uh, like proxy metrics they are uh, they, they can help us you know be confident that we're going to reach the final result mm -hmm. so this sort of idea that metrics can be financial or non-financial like this is a really complicated space right i mean kumran how are you dealing with this uh, from your point of view sort of this idea of return on investment with even you know non-financial metrics sometimes do you see this uh, a lot as well? And when you when you look at you know the A project specifically the long term projects that you saw uh, what Andrea showed in the in the top uh, right uh, corner right, so those are usually projects that are not tactical in nature. They are more strategic, uh, transformational in nature. You are not going to attempt those projects until you know it is going to change the way you do business. Right, those it's those kind of projects which will sit on there. Right, so there are there is a strategic. Uh, outcome out of it and how do you put an ROI ROI the further you are out the ROI is not that well defined it's more a range kind of thing uh, right it's more something that can drastic it's a it's high risk number one and something it can drastically change your mm. company your success if you're successful so it's kind of you know yes. you do something like you know best case worst case most likely case that kind of modeling for example and see, you know, how uh, how the ROI fits in into all these use cases. That's one way to model it. Uh, but but otherwise, you know, it's more a strategic thing uh, where you first want the idea to materialize, and then you want to start look at more like, uh, you know, where you want to go from there. Hmm. Yeah. So we've got this long term vision. We're going to change yep. the game in a couple of years. We're going to do these big long term strategic projects. We've got another question that comes down to people. To execute these things what is the most critical when you want to onboard tech critical staff on an ai transformation journey i'm thinking these long-term strategic projects so you've got it all planned out now you just need to hire people for it how do you tackle this issue andrea yeah it's a good question so uh, fundamentally uh yeah the first one one key component is to get the right talent right and there's always like a trade-off between 
having central teams versus a uh, decentralized team aligned with the business. So uh, really like, uh, especially at the beginning, I think it's important to have a critical mass of great talent, maybe in a, in a centralized team. Um, and then like to, to really have visibility, proper support and, and, and so on. So once you have like the right talent, I think the key component is to have the right environment for experimentation, access to data, uh, the right process, like enabling really the data scientists, the researchers to be very productive. Uh, in many, if that is not uh, true, then, you know, the data scientists can be uh, like sitting like still for uh, for many months, just waiting for the data. So they are like not having access to the right, you know, uh, infrastructure for experimentation. So that is another component. Then the third one, it's a proper engagement with the business. I think fast iteration, exchanging ideas, uh, providing results, uh, like iterating, that, that it's very critical because uh, in this space, in many cases, it's, it's about experimentation, right? We try something, may work, may not work. We need to change direction. So really that feedback with the business, uh, it's very critical. Mm. And when you look for these long-term people, I mean, is there anything that really sticks out to you? We've got all these, we've got our deep learners out here. Is there anything that you'd sort of direct at them as kind of this is a thing that we really look for at JP Morgan for in our AI researchers? Uh, I mean, we look at the different uh, areas. I mean, we have researchers on uh, NLP, definitely, um, then deep learning, reinforcement learning, explainability, as I was mentioning, uh, and then like all, all various techniques as well, even uh, like plan, traditional AI planning, uh, optimization. So. Uh, we got through the, the full spectrum. I think there are use cases in each area. Um, certain areas pick up more in certain cases, uh, some are more long term, but yeah, we look at the full spectrum. Very cool. Kumran, I want to just give you a minute to talk about what you look for in deep learners in long term or short term, uh, you know, that, to really make an impact at Cisco as well. So in, in terms of people, um, the technology in the space is rapidly changing. Right. So what is new today is not I mean, two years down the line. What is new is going to be very different. So we, you need people who are continuous learners. Number one, who can continue to keep up with uh, what this field is doing. That's first. Uh, second is we want people who can deal with uncertainty. Uh, we have engineers who come in and say, I give me exactly what story you want me to build the exact requirements. Uh, don't get frustrated if the requirements change in the middle because this is a very uh, if you look at the way you build models it's not like software development where you know exactly you know what you have to go through here it is like you do one experiment and one sprint then you have some results and that results will determine what you do next so you will go back and kind of redo something or you know delete something and do it in a different way so people should be open with that kind of experimentation they have to come with that experimentation mindset and be able to <laughs> quickly change directions uh, and then of course we need a kind of a complementary skill set within the team because <clears throat> you've got big data machine learning you've got ml ops docker kubernetes you've got all these technologies sitting there and you want to be able to create a kind of you know a, a complementary skill set with the team that you have those skill sets covered so if you have a smaller team uh, you know you're looking at a jack of all trades kind of thing if you have a much bigger team, then you're looking at, okay, I, will have, I can have some specialists. And I always look for somebody who is always the kind of jack of all trades, like somebody who can do across the board. Somebody who can think across the board, somebody who can think at a solution level, how all these pieces can come together. You have all these depth people who are depth into specific areas, and then you have the breadth people who can think across the board and say, how do I pull all this together into one integration, uh, integrated solution? Amazing. You heard it here. This is what the biggest companies in the world, the most successful companies in the world are actually looking for in their deep learners. So with that, I think we're just about ready to app, wrap up. Thank you all out there for all of your great questions. Thank you, Kumaran and Andrea for joining us. This brings us to the end of today's event. We hope that you've enjoyed your time with us and have gotten some valuable information that can help your company prioritize AI and ML projects in the future. Fourth Brain is so grateful to have been able to collaborate with DeepLearning.ai on this event. Both our machine learning engineer program and our MLOps program aim to help learners do exactly what we heard 
learners need to be doing today at companies like like Cisco and like JP Morgan. Check out fourthbrain.ai for more information on our upcoming MLE and MLOps cohorts. And if you're looking to upskill many contributors on your company's team, we also work directly with businesses to, to deliver targeted, shorter form educational programs. As I mentioned earlier, we're offering a special discount of $500 off of either our MLE or MLOps program for anyone that registered for this event. You'll receive a follow-up email with a survey from deeplearning.ai this week. Please let us know if you have any questions on how to improve future events. If you don't want to miss any of them, sign up using the deeplearning.ai subscription link in the description below. If you can't ever make a live event, don't worry, you can always find the recordings on YouTube. See you next time and keep learning. Thank you.